Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Raw our Roundtable podcast. Tonight, we'll be having a formal debate between Gnosticism and Catholicism. You can find us on, on our social media, on um, Roundtable podcast, or you can go to Discord and find us under pol politics and conspiracy. For the Gnosticist side, it'll be myself, Sir Duggleton, debating MJPC88, who will be advocating for Catholicism. So relax and enjoy the debate. Uh, for every debate, we do five minute rounds, either three or five minute rounds each with either three minutes or five or three rounds or five rounds. Tonight we'll be having a three round session. It will start with myself doing an introduction and making debate points followed by MJPC rebuttaling and we will have a back and forth. Uh, say hi to the audience, MJPC. How's it going, everyone? Um, we will start the debate as soon as our timer rolls. Okay, you guys both ready? Um, who is presumably first? I will be first. Okay. Well, do your presentation of the beginning statement of what's being talked about, and um, or are we starting instantly with points? I'll uh, I'll do an I'll do an interjection along like included with my five minutes. So just start the clock whenever. Okay, well that doesn't make any sense. Just say I'm ready when you want the minute oh. to start. Um, I'm ready. Go. Cool. So Gnosticism is a wide collection of beliefs. Freemasonry, Kabbalism, most occultism is classified as Gnosticism. My brand of Gnosticism goes exclusively as far as the Nag Hammadi does. There are a collection of scriptures found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt that are mostly Christian apocrypha, dealing with heaven, New Test or post-resurrection history, uh, a little bit of exterior sources like Plato and Hermes Trimagestus. What people say about these books in general are, aren't true to what the books say. I've had people tell me that the Gospel of Philip denies that Mary was a virgin when it literally states that she was a virgin. I've had people tell me that the Nag Hammadi states that in order to receive salvation, you must pursue hidden knowledge. When uh, the secret book of James says that unless people believe on Jesus' cross, no one will be saved. People tell me that Gnostics deny the crucifixion and resurrection, where the crucifixion and resurrection is centerpiece to it happening. People try to tell me that the Old Testament God and the Nag Hammadi is uh, the devil, but it clearly states that the Old Testament is the plan of God and it promises Jesus Christ uh, his death and resurrection and the book, The Gospel of Truth. Uh, in my experience in studying this book verse by verse, it is probably one of the most viciously lied about books in the history of uh, any sort of literature, I would say even more so than the Bible. Whoever wrote these books was intimately familiar with the Old Testament and the New Testament in Hebrew and Greek. There's as far as most of the claims, if they were true, if they denied the crucifixion and resurrection, if they denied virgin birth, if they denied it at a numerable any amount of things, I would be inclined to agree with them. But church father and church history has condemned these books out of a place of ignorance and hearsay. And I can't back any of the claims they made based on what these scriptures state, especially when they get the issues of sin and redemption from sin correct. I've also heard people say that it denies that or makes Jesus into a man when the teachings of Slavonis clearly stated or Christ to be God. So it's, and as far as who has authority to determine what is divinely inspired and what isn't, I would like to point out Irenaeus and just a martyr, along with several other early church fathers, used the book of Enoch as divinely inspired and authoritative, while Augustine among later church fathers completely denied and vehemently attacked these books for the manic or for the manichaean use of them so you can't you have two sources early, early church fathers who are revered in catholicism and eastern orthodoxy and any other christian denomination but they have a clear disagreement on what scripture is one of the key things that this shows is that these people are unreliable in determining what is and isn't canon. And among with many other verses in the Bible, 
the fact that they fail to have signs that follow believers in their history, uh, a complete almost denial of spiritual gifts and the amillennial which was the denial that Christ reigns on earth physically for a thousand years, it goes to show that it's it's just not a fruitful understanding. Tradition has corrupted understanding of scripture, much like Pharisee and Sadducee, or Sadducee tradition has. And these books, because of their ideas and because of places like John 21, 25, where it says Jesus did so many things that if the or if they were all written of that the world cannot contain the weight of the books that John sixteen twelve states that Jesus has things to say that uh, we cannot even bear to hear now, and the fact that we literally have a stump of what's left of Christianity through years of just burning literature from the Roman Empire killing every Christian for three hundred years, the following pattern with Theodosius in three eighty A D making Roman Catholicism a state religion and killing anybody who didn't accept it, along with the 1,400-year persecution of Christianity, burning every single Christian book in existence in the Islamic side of things. We, these books deserve an unbiased investigation through not any church father lens, but through a biblical lens. I yield my time. Thank you, Sir Duggleton. Let me know when you'd like to start. All right, we can begin. So the position I'm going to be taking that criticizes Gnosticism is the classic understanding of the difference between salvation through faith versus salvation through knowledge. And the reason I'm going to focus on this is because we have to make sure that we don't confuse one's calling with a temptation. Um, both callings and temptations are intuitive processes, but one is graceful while the other is graceless. Uh, we have to remember that grace is a mysterious attribute and the notion of believing that you can achieve salvation through knowledge, it ends up denying at some level the value of mystery. Now, this is what ends up becoming the problem in a lot of these Gnostic texts because their oversimplification of the truth begs the question as to whether or not salvation itself is being revealed. Um, we have to remember that people are finite beings in contrast to the infiniteness of God. And this is a general theme that's taken with regards to the scholastic method, whether it comes to the definition of canon scripture itself, or we're talking about how scripture should be interpreted, whether it's in an allegorical, a literal, a moral, or a, a tropological sense. What we really have to appreciate here is how when we're being tempted, we are often having our desire for information to be clarified, overemphasized. We have to remember that when we are engaging in a graceful understanding of revealed truth, that we are having a divergent, not a convergent process. And I say this because, uh, you know, Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict, he focuses on how the problem that the church has today is the law, the, uh, the loss of sensus commonness, you know, common sense in the classic sense of the uh, phrase going back to Paul's journeys through Greece when he was originally evangelizing the faith. Uh, the goal here was to appreciate how regardless of the result in life, there's a process. But we also have to remember that as finite beings, every result that we encounter when we learn something is just another step on the path to salvation. When this path is properly taken, it means that there will always be further levels to be understood. You know, as the classic saying goes, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So the idea of the Gnostic path leading to salvation is kind of contradictory here because it's suggesting that we're not coming to a divergent understanding but a converging understanding of what salvation is supposed to really be about uh, we're, we're told time and time again in scripture that only god is going to know when the end times are upon us and what this suggests as well is that divergent understanding there is no way for us to for example come to a numerological understanding of the end times and we are not uh, entitled nor expected to try to test God's plan. You know, we are servants of the divine. We are not, uh, we're not determining what the divine actually is, right? So if we try to anticipate things and then we're saying, like, oh, well, these results ought to happen, then are we really trying to follow God's path or are we trying to conform God's path to our wishes? We don't want to engage in the vice or the sin of vanity. And we have to remember that we're supposed to be humble while doing so. 
Um, what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the nature of the scholastic method. So when we go to the Council of Trent, when a lot of these books were actually determined, we have to remember that the scholastic method often involved the usage of dialectic, not analytic, uh, approach towards scripture. So what we're trying to do here is bring a bunch of people together to construct consensus instead of simply saying that, oh, I've read through something and I've come to some interpretation, therefore my interpretation makes sense. Um, we have to remember that while God may have given us the word in a perfect way because he is infinite. That doesn't mean that we as finite beings also heard what was said in a perfect way. Uh, we as finite beings are going to be imperfect. And you know, this doesn't mean that scripture becomes imperfect. It just means that God understood our limitations as finite beings. And there was only so much information that he wanted to reveal. He knew that if he tried to reveal more than what could reasonably or feasibly be revealed, that people would start taking information in the wrong way. So this is what happens when we're talking about canon, because when you look at things like the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Thomas, there is an excessive degree of clarity that refers to specific details. And this suggests that indeed we are no longer dealing with the mystery of faith anymore. Um, what was the last thing I want to talk about? Um, 20 seconds. Thank you. Um, the last thing we just say is that we need to make sure that our understanding of good works is not something that we become presumptuous about, because when we start being presumptuous about this, it leads to us believing that we are greater than the divine and realizing how salvation is going to happen. And that's really the issue of the Gnostic pursuit of knowledge to achieve Time. salvation. Thank you. Okay, um, you can start it. So, the, the Gnostic pursuit of knowledge, or salvation through knowledge is not found in the Nag Hammadi. There might be other Gnostic sects who push this, but the Nag Hammadi scriptures make it very clear that faith in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection is what gives you salvation. As far as the idea of knowledge, it seems widely condemned in Catholicism despite the fact that uh, the knowledge of God is a highly elevated thing. The book of Hosea says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Uh, the lands are condemned because they have no knowledge of God in the land. Uh, God desires mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It's an essential theme in the word gnosis or knowledge is not about having knowledge but about having relationship in genesis adam knows eve adam is intimate with eve in the new testament we are to know christ and that comes through faith um in john 15 jesus says you are my friends if you do what i command i no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business instead i call you friends for everything that i have learned from my father i have made known unto you so when you get to the point where you know jesus like a friend you get to know specifics and with the gospel of judas that there's no issue of like knowledge through or salvation through knowledge the issue is the mystery of betrayal um out of all the people jesus when he taught the crucifixion and resurrection what happened was people denied him and i would have to state that denying the crucifixion and resurrection of jesus is a major heresy we see it in islam and that's why they're so misguided on what jesus is as far as the council of trent determining what is and isn't like a uh, proper interpretation here, here's the aspect of this like god isn't like He's a limitless being, but first and foremost, he's every Christian's father. And a father raises the athlete differently than he raises the musician. As far as something that's together, or that's the same as that a father would teach their children, is laziness is a poor trait. God hates laziness in the Bible. There's no misinterpreting that. But what God tells his athlete's son is going to be different than what he tells his musician's son. That isn't contradictory. That's just different different people get raised in different ways. Uh, as far as the Gospel of Thomas, it's the book itself is... Do we can we have a pause, pause in time? Yeah, let's have a pause. Is that guy, is that uh, guy gone? Well, I think there were two of them. I wasn't really paying there attention. There was um, several things going on, and I fixed it, but... I was looking at the clock. I'll just give you like two or minus two seconds. 
Okay. So, hang on. Uh, wait a minute. It's these guys are back. One of them was Hank. Yeah. Yeah, one of them was Hank. Um, um can I get a go on. Yeah, are you there? I'm having a formal debate right now, so nobody's supposed to be talking other than those participating. Go. So, as far as like the Council of Trent, that these books weren't around or made knowledge as are during the Council of Trent. And like I said, my first point that church tradition is entirely useless in deciding what is and isn't canon, considering these church fathers have no unanimous direction. There's also the account of the us. Uh, I think over two dozen books in the Old Testament that are referenced to as being the Word of God, like the Book of Joshua, the Book of Jubilees, that are just lost to us in time. There's the fact that the Epistle of Jude references this book called The Assumption of Moses when talking about Michael fighting Satan over the body of Moses. Like, there's there's more to the story than what we have. We have 30 days into Jesus' life. We have maybe a few months all together of the issues of the early church and we don't have anything about their lives like past 70 AD we have nothing in the Bible about the Apostles lives and everything in heaven is written in parable except for a few things that Jesus told the Apostles like there's elaboration in in all these things to those who ask, if you're to ask God what ha or what did the seven thunders say in the book of Revelation, I have no doubt in my it. mind I have no doubt in my mind that he would give you these things. Like it's the word knowledge in itself isn't the or gnosis isn't salvation through knowledge. It's you receive salvation through faith and you come into knowledge or you come in a relationship. The word knowing implies relationship. I yield my time. Start. Okay, just to be clear with regards to specific references and verses, um, when we're done here, I'm going to provide a, a document that gives any number of links to whatever uh, verses I want to talk about here. But going back to the original point about the value of faith and knowledge, um, Pope John Paul II in 1998, he wrote an encyclical called Fidus Ratio, and he's not denying the value of reason or the value of knowledge at all. It's important to recognize all of the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, which we are endowed with. And this this doesn't mean that we're supposed to despise knowledge in general or despise reason in general. It's just an understanding of how our salvation comes about. Does this mean that we're supposed to become naive? Does it mean that we're supposed to become ignorant? No, absolutely not. Um, I, I say this especially with regards to the difference between the Carmelites and the Cathars in the south of France in the 13th century. Here we have one monastic order that cared about exercising self-control and engaging in charity and recognizing how there was a limit to how much we could enjoy God's creation of the natural world. And then on the other, we had this group that simply sought to claim that the natural world in and of itself was innately evil. Um, we have to, again, recognize that, you know, God created the world. And when the Cathars are approached by a papal emissary in order to reform their beliefs, and by the way, this emissary was not a Carmelite, but rather was a Cistercian. So we have multiple monastic orders who recognize this. Um, they end up actually killing the guy. Their persecution is not really a persecution, but more of a prosecution and understanding that if you're going to eliminate those who try to talk about the truth with you, then how are you supposed to construct consensus? I, I bring this matter of consensus up because when we talk about canon and we want to talk about the ancient books, we have to recognize that there are limits to what was technologically viable. You know, ancient history in general has certain obstacles when it comes to the recording of information. And while, yeah, there are many gaps, we have to make do with those gaps. Um, it's, it's not because of a lack of trying, it's just because the fact of the matter is only so and so many publications are going to be uh, preserved. And while the word of God may have been disclosed, that doesn't mean that people in the process of preserving that which was disclosed were perfect in their preservation efforts. So, yeah, you can argue that there are however many books that were included or excluded, but you can't say, oh, we're just going to, you know, toss in things in order to, you know, create a God of the gaps. We have to actually understand that there are certain things which are going to be consistent, certain things which are inconsistent. 
So we're talking about knowledge here. We're talking about the natural world. We can't believe in, for example, Demiurge. Okay, we can't treat, oh, there's the spiritual world and this natural world that are in conflict. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, with regards to the specific books, I, I, I read through the Gospel of Thomas, and I was just seriously baffled at how in the world you could even consider this to even plausibly be canon. Um, the, the idea of Jesus actually explaining these specific details is just so bizarre. Go, going to the bottom, he, he, there's this remark about the transformation of females into males. It's like, one minute. Was that the one minute mark? Yes. Okay. It, it, it just it doesn't make sense. We're, we're supposed to recognize how all God's creations are innately graceful. So the idea of believing that some of these creations have to be transformed into something else in order to achieve salvation, it's like, what? That's so bizarre. I, I just, I don't understand how you could recognize this as gospel, and I don't, I just don't see how you could expect clergy to recognize this as being a gospel or canon either. So, that's all I have to say for this section. So, in regards to that, uh, that has to be taken in context of verse 22, where it says, uh, I'll just read the part, that you might make the male and female be one and the same, so that male might not be male, nor female be female. I mean, Jesus told Peter this in the end of the Gospel of Thomas because he didn't understand verse 22. I, I like to point out that this idea is also cited in the Epistle of Paul, where he does, he almost abolishes the idea of race or gender. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, then, then ye are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Like the idea the idea of gender is kind of abolished in New Testament literature. Like yes, we still have male and female, yes, people still get married and have children. But in the idea of or mindset of heaven, it's all these things become one and they're rooted back into into their first spot. Um, I just wanted to point out that it, the Bible actually does say that not, or salvation comes through knowledge in Luke 1. It's, a, it's John's prophecy. And you shall be called the prophet of the highest, for you go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, which is of the day spring from on high has visited us so the idea is that salvation it comes through faith but you have to know what you're saved by you can't just believe you're saved you have to know that it's the the crucifixion the sacrifice of jesus that does it there's no salvation outside of it and the only way to have it is to have knowledge of it if you don't know about it then you can't be saved so it's in a way the bible does endorse an idea of knowledge or salvation through knowledge as far as, what else were you saying? Like, and like I said, these books deserve a look through, an unbiased look through just a biblical lens. You, one of Irenaeus' arguments for there only being four Gospels was because there are four directions to the wind. If I were, I could make the same argument. I can say, well, there are actually only there are actually only four apostles because there's four directions to the wind. That's obviously untrue because biblically we have uh, 12 or 13 apostles, well, actually more apostles than, than just them, but you get the point. Like if we have a, if we have a book called the gospel of Philip and it deserves an unbiased or look through to see if it lines up with scripture. If we have a book called the secret book of James, I mean, we have examples of Jesus teaching things in secret. He taught, he taught, uh, being born again of water and the spirit to one person in the middle of the night. And we have no record of him ever teaching this to any of the other apostles. Only three of the apostles saw the transfiguration. And only one apostle, or one disciple rather, Mary Magdalene, was given charge to tell everybody else about the resurrection. He didn't go to John and say, go gather the apostles and tell them I've been raised. He didn't go to Peter. He didn't go to, he went to only Mary Magdalene, which speaks, which, which speaks, a completely new mystery because we have no real we have no real understanding of her in the bible other than she sat at jesus's feet one time um 
As far as Cathars and the world being evil, uh, I'd like to cite uh, the first epistle of John, which makes constant references to the world being uh, wickedness. Uh, um, in First John five nineteen, it says, "As we know, we are of God. The whole world lieth in wickedness. Uh, he who becomes a friend of the world becomes the enemy of the God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world." Um, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, because the world is going to hate us. Like, um, there's there's a absolute contrast in the world basically having it out for Christians and having it out for our spirits, the lust of the flesh, war, or war against the spirit, and they try to kill the spirit. It's there's something about the world and the flesh that's trying to kill the One spirit, minute. and it's evident in the New Testament. As far as the demiurge, like here's the thing the demiurge is like a platonic idea from their philosophy and john the first chapter of john gives some sort of validity to platonic philosophy because john one states that in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the the idea that and everything was created by the word the idea that everything was created by logos came from plato a few hundred years before the uh, before the Gospel of John was written. And Platonic philosophy in itself is uh, somebody trying to understand how the world was made through their own reasoning. And for whatever reason, this this man came up with the idea that the word Logos created the world by God. So and as I would like to state that I've come to a reconciliation that the Demiurge is actually the beast of Revelation. And the beast of Revelation at one point was an infant. Um, I yield my time. Lol, you had two seconds. This is the final statement. Um, by... MJ. MJ. Um, and then we'll be done. And then it will open up. Go. Okay. So, just to make a point before I elaborate. Um, we need to clarify the difference between the world and society. Literally, what we're talking about here is the natural, physical, tangible world. We're not talking about how people will treat each other like garbage. Um, there's plenty of recognitions within Catholicism of how we're supposed to recognize that the persecution of faith can happen and how, despite that persecution happens, we're supposed to go through it. Um, and it's not because we want to go through it, but rather because we're supposed to be an example for others to recognize and how we're supposed to stay loyal in our faith towards the divine. Um, I'm just going to give a quick example with Ephesians 2.8-9, to For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not from yourself or anything you've done, but the gift of God. The focus here is on an understanding of justification that leads to salvation. And this is especially important when we have to understand how people are born with the capacity to accept grace. We have to realize that knowledge is not something people are innately born with, and this especially applies towards the the, uh, the newly born or the young who indeed are not completely aware of what's going on. Yet, as long as they accept grace in their life, they're still going to be brought into heaven because of the fact that they have chosen to be faithful. They don't necessarily know what they're being faithful about, but they do have this underlying temperament of caring about the world. So do I really want to condemn or should you want to condemn or should anyone want to condemn? Would God want to condemn those who are unaware of the truth? We have to, again, recognize the difference between what we are aware of and what we are committed to. Um, there's something specific I want to bring up. Um, let's see. Oh, th this was actually the issue that came about when it came to uh, Angelus of Jerusalem. Okay. So when we are talking about the Cathars, we're talking about people who were literally raising people from the very beginning of their life to believe that the natural world, the tangible physical world, was innately wrong. These were people who compelled people, even against their consent, to live this lifestyle where they were expected to engage in such self-control that it was completely dissociating them from the mystery of joy when it comes to how the world works. Uh, Angelus of Jerusalem, he literally dies because of this. And while he wasn't the guy who died in order to trigger the Albigensian crusade, it was evidence that indeed that the Catholic belief was carrying on even after the Albigensian crusade was carried out in order to control this, I mean, I would qualify it as horrific, but you know, this atrocious belief system. Um, 
I, I don't know if you guys are really familiar, but the Albigensian Crusade, this is not something that people are particularly proud of, and it has to be understood that it needs to be taken with an understanding of humility. We need to recognize that, unfortunately, some people refuse to bend, and they persist in believing that no matter what, that their knowledge about the natural world will lead them to some sort of understanding as to what it takes to become saved. They end up dissociating between the joy that they're experiencing versus that knowledge. And we have to realize that that is not how the world works. It's not how God created the world. The Albigensian Crusade it would eventually lead to a longer problem within French history. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this either, but there was something called the War of Sicilian Vespers where the French went in the completely opposite direction, and they ended up trying to exploit people in order to compensate for the joy which was repressed. The consequence was some people ended up getting hurt, and those people literally ended up appealing to the Pope uh, himself in order to achieve some sort of freedom that avoided the oppression, which was a consequence of this terrible belief. Um, this war One minute. would lead to another war called the Aragonese Crusade, which would lead to the Avignon Papacy and a terrible amount of corruption, which would fester within the church for a long time. But we have to understand that this corruption was not originating from Catholic beliefs themselves. It was originating from this pursuit of knowledge before pious faith. Um, again, I'm going to post a document that shows a summary of my sources here because I fear that I would need to use the time wisely. But uh, for the time being, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. You both did very good. Now, I will open it up to if you guys want to clarify anything or specifically talk about the document. Yeah. Um, where would you like me to post my document? I mean, it looks like general just chat's just being used, but is there another channel you want me to post it in? We have a special events channel. Yeah, well... Okay, yeah. I, I scroll down, I can see that. So yeah, I'll, I'll post my uh, my document there. Give me a second. Okay, there you have it. So, uh... Yeah, if anyone wants to ask any questions, fire away. No, you wrote a little paper on this. Oh, that's one of my shorter ones. <laughs> you should have seen my debate notes for uh, another debate I did that had to defend the Soviet Union. It was like 15 pages of notes on that one. <laughs> why would you Why would you ever do such a thing? Defending the Soviet Union? <laughs> and, and like, wait, wait, what's the context of that? Um, so I had to debate... Uh, why the end of the Soviet Union was bad for world peace. And uh, that was a really long debate, but I'll, I'll, oh, I'll talk about that okay. later. <laughs> no, I, like... Should I end the recording? No, I'm just making a joke there. We can stop. No. no, no, okay, no, We're I gonna... just... No, it's fine. If you guys want to continue, like, whatever, I just... Um, I have no idea how long the recording is. Well, obviously, it's really close to, um, five, 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 five. So that's not that long. So it's like thirty-ish minutes. So we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll just have an open discussion about the subject, I and think then so that the formal debate would be followed by like twenty minutes of open discussion. Yeah. So, can so, can okay. you give me a definition of grace that you was talking about? What What is it? Did you ever see it? Are you Did you ever touch it? Well, whoever's talking about grace, this grace thing, you're born with grace. Okay, so you're, you're asking me. Um, well, you mean you're born with, from a female. I, I don't know. I, I don't get it. So the word for grace in Greek, um, it, it means grace or kindness as a gift or a blessing, uh, favor, gratitude. So basically it's, it's kind of having predisposed favor like we're we're saved by grace through the fact that we we had favor before uh anything else really i don't know if you would agree with that definition but i, I think that's close to uh, or pretty close to the greek and biblical context so my grasp in the catholic understanding is it is a recognition of the potential for us to be good willing 
Um, this is highly different from other denominations, some of which say that it is automatically actualized by default, and some believe that among some people it is not actualized at all. Um, so, like, what would an example of grace be? Uh, you have examples like charity, hope, uh, mercy, but I think it goes a little bit further than that. It, it's more about the motive behind why you perform a good work. You know, we recognize that good works reveal themselves in mysterious ways because of our acceptance of grace. So, really, what does that mystery mean? And at some level, this goes back to what I was talking about in the very beginning. It's the value of divergence. It's an understanding of what it means to be open-minded. It's a realization of how people's lives can progress in many different ways and that whether they're going to progress in this, that, or the other way, or being considerate and courteous regardless of that way. Um, you know, different people have different strengths and different weaknesses when it comes to how we are endowed with the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? So a graceful person recognizes how strengths and weaknesses can be manifested in many different ways. Does that answer your question? Well, your question? well, if I told you if you was born to die, is that the same thing as born of grace? Because uh, we're, we're, see, you're, this human race is blind slave planet. And y'all don't know what y'all condition is yet. And I know. So, but what I'm saying is, this born of grace is an illusion because you're born to die and suffer on this planet. Yeah. So it's not, uh, whatever y'all believe in this stuff is, I mean, it's really not true. Because I'm the one that sees. I see demons all over the place. We're under control of evil aliens and stuff. And I don't want to blow up your bubble, but uh, you need to get into real reality, you know. I hate open eyes. We're doing a debate. Yeah, we're we're, we're we have a subject in mind. Please don't derail. Also, for everybody, there's a straw poll. We we do these after every debate. Just vote for whoever you think presented a or presented a stronger argument for the debate. It's not so much as which side you agree with is which side presented their arguments better. Oh, what you what y'all debating about? Uh, Catholicism versus Gnosticism. So uh, I like to I like to point out uh, I, I guess a product of fruits. I mean, as far as Catholic corruption goes, it's I I have to say it's not endless. Uh, and for Gnostic corruption, we don't have any good works or bad works, mostly because all the Gnostics are dead, and we're, we're burnt alive and all that kind of stuff. I mean, with Catholicism, you have child abuse scandals on six continents. You have the Age of Harlots, which was uh, just short of 1080 before the Abij uh, the Crusade. I can't say that term. The Albigensian Crusade. We have the Go Inquisition, where when as soon as the Portuguese found the Indians or Thomasinian Christians in India, they kind of systematically exterminated them over accusations of paganism. Uh, and which is ironic because Jeremiah 10 talks about not cutting down a tree and pinning it with gold and silver, um, so, and pinning it so it doesn't move like the like the heathens or the pagans do, and that's a that's a tradition pushed through not just Catholics or Orthodox, but actually through Protestants too. It's it's really kind of mind twisting when you like when you start picking up scriptures and start seeing how we teach the opposite thereof. So one thing I was because I've actually studied the history of corruption in the church, and going back to what you're talking about with regards to the Age of Harlots, this is something that stems with what's known as the Tusculan Papacy. Basically, Charlemagne ends up passing away. The Frankish Empire becomes divided, and the Byzantine Empire seeks to replace the Franks as the defender of the faith because they were displaced after their own corruption, which was going on among their own you know, political quarrels and qualms. Those quarrels and qualms are often traced back to the pursuit of knowledge before faith in the first place, because a lot of political quarrels and qualms deal with who knows who, who knows what, and conspiring behind other people's backs uh, when nobody's watching. This is the classic lesson of the story of Joseph at the end of Genesis, understanding how people can do bad things when nobody's watching and they can try to get away with it. And then those who are conspired against are expected to forgive those who conspired against them and to prop them up. Um, this was the excuse taken by the Theophylacti family when it came to subverting the papacy. And you do see one of its 
uh, women even get promoted to the level of senatrix of Rome. Um, this carries on for, I think it's about, I think it's about 150 years until finally this guy, Pope Gregory, comes along. And Pope Gregory, he tries to launch something called the Gregorian Reforms, and they fail, but it's not his fault. Let me just explain what's going on here. So you have the Holy Roman Empire, which ends up taking both the Franks and the Byzantines' place as defender of the faith. And Henry IV tries to exploit the bishoprics for his own personal prestige and personal revenue sources. Pope Gregory tells Henry IV, no, you can't do what you're doing. This is ridiculous. And he basically tries to excommunicate Henry IV from the church in order to reclaim the bishoprics for their rightful usage for uh, pious purposes. Now, this ends up backfiring because Pope Gregory takes refuge in the Alps, and then Henry IV, he goes into the Alps to track him down. And he tries to, uh, you know, pray to him while there's this blistering blizzard going on. And you know, because of that, you know, Pope Gregory has to forgive him. But the long and short of it there is that the papacy was trying to recover itself. And it was just this overwhelming effort to say, no, we're going to screw with you. We're going to violate your pursuits of clerical celibacy. Um, I mean, the church did make a very deliberate effort to recognize Manichaeism as being terrible. There are times where there is this confusion of agape with eros with regards to certain ceremonies. And, you know, the church goes, no, 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 no. You have to discern between agape and eros. Uh, this also deals with why we have things like the abuse scandals. You know, people get the different forms of love confused. Agape, eros, pragmas, dorge, philia, ludus, mania, and philoctia are not all the same thing, either in whether they are informal or formal, whether they involve definite or indefinite commitments or finite or infinite uh, concerns. So we need to remember the different forms of love. And when we are faithful, we need to remember that, oh, okay, just because we don't know every specific form that can happen doesn't, we can't have a general appreciation of what those forms are. Um, did you want to say anything in response? Um, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying with like, and there, I can't remember his name. There's one Pope who I'm actually a fan of because he tried to, he tried to root out all the corruption. He banned, I'm sure when I list off his resume, you, you, you'll you know the Pope by name. He banned the selling of offices. Uh, he got rid of like all the prostitution. I, actually, I don't even remember everything else he did. That, that was, some, period? Uh, no, I don't. I know he was pretty early though. Um, I'll, I'll have the name for you. I, I do recognize that there are good popes who, who try to like get rid of corruption, but it's but like when you look through the history of that it it just seems like they're fighting an uphill battle that's losing, and now you have like Pope John Paul II like kissing a Quran. We have popes venerating the Quran uh, between Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, and uh, we have. Catholic churches in Italy uh, doing Islamic prayers and uh, reading from the Quran. We, we have we have what seems to be a huge alliance between Islam and Catholicism in this day and age, which uh, like knowing that Islam is responsible for just an absolute desolation of Christianity, it, it begs the question what's really going on behind the scenes. Uh, I don't know how much stock you put in uh, just a quick question. How much stock do you put in the photos of popes and high Catholic officials engaging in Freemasonic handshakes? Um, wow, that is a question. <laughs> um, okay, which time period are you talking about there again? Are you talking about um, actually, I mean, stuff or 19th just, century stuff? Uh, just just I, I don't have any examples of popes engaging in Freemasonic symbolism in the 19th century. I only have these modern examples in the past 50 ish years, I'd say, because I know there's been a couple of accusations of popes being Freemasons in the 19th century, but I, I don't have any like uh, record that I would count as reliable for so that. With regards to the 19th century, my understanding is that the Catholic Church was highly critical of a heresy called Americanism in that it thought that there was too much leeway being granted already. So I don't really think those records are reliable. With regards to the modern pursuits, um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually not that familiar with the photographs and stuff, so I'd have to look at them and see what in that world of context is and what's going on. I, I can I can pull some for you, and then I don't know if you need a 
if you need a reference for free Masonic handshakes. Well, I'm, I'm trying to look it up at the moment. Um, oh, well. Do you, have, do you have a specific thing I should look up? I don't, uh, just Pope Francis is the most recent one, and then Pope Benedict does a few. Um, I've got a question, and, if it's a good time. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure it's uh, up to the quality of the discussion, but the w one thing that I gather is that you both seem to stipulate to the fact that there are lost books, uh, lost knowledge, and de considerable debate over what should have been included in canon at various times in history. Given that, it, it seems like you have to deal with a lot of uncertainty. And... I guess the question is, how do you arrive at a firm theological position um, without taking a leap of faith that should be reserved for the faith in God rather than in your interpretation? Um, I'll, I'll take this one first. So um, my, my touchstone is uh, the 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, right? So when stuff doesn't agree with that um then that's how i know it's false like the gospel of barnabas is a 15th century text found in turkey and one of the things it does is it denies the crucifixion and resurrection there's another gospel that was written in the fourth century that his name starts to be i can't recall it from the top of my head that does the same thing so when I get in, the, when I see books that deny that Jesus was ever crucified and resurrected, that Jesus, and this is something I, I wanted to touch on because there are things that in the Catholic doctrine I don't agree with, but the um, the extermination of them or any other um, quote unquote Protestant group is unfounded, and I I also. I also strongly debate the validity of the claims made against them because I know Cathars deny that Jesus came in the flesh because the flesh was inherently evil. While I would hold to the position that the flesh is uh, has been made inherently evil, not that it was initially, um, that I, I, I doubt that if they had the epistles of John or if they had like John, the gospel of John that they they held these positions because they used the scriptures to great to lead or to live moral lives but getting back on topic it's because these books agree with the bible uh with the exception of a few which are which are the books i, I have my doubts on because these books aren't specifically new testament apocrypha or mysteries of heaven revealed they're kind of these um they're, they're kind of these chants, which I have, like having an idea of what mantras are in Hinduism, or uh, an idea of occultism, are books I would say planted by the enemy. As far as everything else, I, I'd have to be because like the prayer of the Apostle Thomas, because the teachings of Sylvanus, because etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, lines up with the canonical Bible. It's to be leaned on as not canon, but having the same divine inspiration. So there's a few points that we want to make there. The first is, you know, I, I remember it was brought up a few times, you know, just how people in, of, of pagan civilizations would get persecuted. Now, we have to understand in the Catholic Church, there are things called the Councils of Paderborn and the Council of, uh, of Frankfurt. These were councils that were passed while Charlemagne was defender of the faith. And he recognized how witch hunting needed to be strictly prohibited. And the question for this is why? And the answer, because in Catholicism, we recognize how good works reveal themselves in mysterious ways. Um, it is not our entitlement to presume how good works ought to manifest themselves. And we have to respect how different people are on different paths when it comes to their realization of grace. Now, this is how the scholastic method works when it comes to determining what qualifies as canon. If you have books that deny the value of mystery because they get into specific details, that's when you start to realize that they're not really revealing the truth. Um, this is a general qualm that Catholicism will have with philosophy, uh, whether it's rational philosophy, empirical philosophy, or what have you philosophy. Um, and there's also something that was brought up time and time again when it came to the Copernican Revolution. The idea there being that truth was just being explicitly revealed, and the consequence of this would, it would lead to people coming to expectations 
based upon what they had experienced. Now, a lot of people often get confused here. They're like, well, why in the world would you think that the Copernican revolution was something to be taken advantage of for malicious intent, right? And it, it, it's actually very obvious one that a lot of people don't think about, but it's that when you engage in heliocentrism, I mean, it's obviously correct, but if you simply engage in a better form of judging the position of Earth among the stars, then it leads to your ability to navigate becoming more efficient. Now, what happened at the same time that people were using this? They were, you know, sailing around the world, they were engaging in colonial imperialism, and they were oppressing these foreign peoples everywhere. The point here being, if you simply focus on a scientific pursuit of knowledge, but you don't care about the faithfully pious grace in the usage of it, people are going to get hurt. And the Catholic Church even recognized this. It would uh, pass things like the Sublimus Deus Papal Bull. It would engage in the Salamanca School Reform of Spanish Colonization. It would advocate the, uh, the position of Bartolome de los Casas in the Valladolid debate. The Habsburg Empire would pass the new laws, all of which want to stand up for natural pagans around the world who are trying to discover grace in their own ways. So bringing this back to your original question, how do you determine if a book is canon or not? It's simple. Does it on a scholastic basis appreciate the mystery of good works? If it does, then it is consistent. If it doesn't, then we have a problem. Interesting. Uh 30, like a 20 second thought experiment. Um, I'm not quite sure how it pertains to this discussion, but um... <laughs> I have an uh, I have an example, if you don't mind. Okay, if you want to start, go ahead. So I was an atheist, and I turned deist. So I tried to understand what how to live by God's original blueprint. And so when I when I had this realization from oh. God is real, there's no soul, there's no spirit to, oh my goodness, God is real, there's a soul, there's a spirit. I tried to, um, I, I tried to really like reconcile my soul, my spirit unto God. And I did try to do it via natural ways. Um, one of the things that, um, that I came to the conclusion of was that swearing was objectively evil. And like, there's no way, there's no way to cut it. If you say a bad word, you're, it's, it's like a stain on your soul. So I, I do natural law and understanding. I, I reconcile that swearing was wrong and I should stop doing it. I reconciled that, um, because there is a God, uh, there is such a thing as marriage and sex is sacred because it, 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 it does what does, or it does what God does and it makes new life. Um, as far as, so through like a natural understanding of things, I was able to reconcile myself to biblical principles. And the key thing I came across was, um, I would, I would think about the breath a lot and I excellent had words, Doug, can somebody, let me, um, can I, let me, let me finish. So I was trying to, um, one of the things I realized was I couldn't, uh, I had no idea about my breath and I realized that my breath was a natural mechanism in my body. And if I was responsible for my breath, I would die. And so I had theorized that God took responsibility for me breathing because he loves me. And it's, it's something that if I were put in charge of, I would literally die. So God claims responsibility of that over me. So I figured if I would focus on my breath and just my breath, is how I would is how I would draw close to God, and would do these exercises about focusing on my breath. It was it was the closest I've ever been with God, and the more I try to do this, the more I lined up with biblically um, or biblical characteristics on living, as well as just uh, I guess understanding the natural world. So it's the the answer that like these stories would be lost, but there would be a way to get them back and the 
the reason why I say we could get them back is basically God would give it, give it to us back. And there would be really undeniable ways of showing how God would give us each each uh, book uh, letter by letter. All right, um, do you want to unmute Rat or like, have to um, respond? Or... Can know who we're interviewing, please? And, we... and then I'll shut it. So, Ratbed, we just got done with a debate of about Catholicism versus Gnosticism. And we're having an open discussion about the subject now. So on the subject of Catholicism versus Gnosticism, if you would like to continue the dialogue. But right now, MJ is responding to a question from Snell Patrick. Is MJ the one who's the interviewee real quick He's, and, the, no, and no, then no. I'm done? There's no, there's no interviewee. We had a debate, debate between me and him. And right now, um, just fin finish the question, MJPC. Yeah, I was defending Catholicism, and he was defending Gnosticism. It's not an interview here. Um, okay, so my approach to that was a transcendental proof. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much right now, but I, I think we have to understand that if you want to focus on this natural scientific world and all that, you have to understand that science depends upon math. Right. You, you can't do science without math. Even if you want to talk about rigorous statistics, you can't do statistics without integrating the natural logarithm into a Gaussian function in order to figure out the bell curve by which you determine levels of significance. Right. So, I, I, again, I don't want to get into the details here, but the long and short of it is there are transcendental infinite <laughs> ideas which are required in order to understand the natural world around us. Um, you combine that with conservation of self-awareness and you end up with an omnipotent omnipresent omniscient being you apply that to the the web of time that recognizes the many-to-many -many relationship between cause and effect across past present and future and that allows us to realize the existence of an afterlife okay but the thing is despite all of this transcendental idealism we still have to put faith first because even with these transcendental ideas we don't know all of the concrete details of the world. And like I said in the uh, in the debate, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. It's just the nature of being a finite being in an infinite situation. You will never know everything. So at some level, you will always have to have an appreciation of the divergence of the truth with regards to anything that you know. And that nature of divergence, which leads to an appreciation of the mystery of faith in a graceful manner, inevitably compels you to recognize these virtues and the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So does that make sense? <laughs> Snarl? Okay. Did anybody else have a question? Yeah, I did. What's up? Wait, wait a minute. Did, did Why the fuck are you so gay, you pussy? You Yo, come on, my man. Be civil. Rat, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? No, I literally just got here, and it says interview with a cannibal, and I wanted to know who the interviewee oh. was. Oh, we, we never changed it. the channel name. This this okay. isn't an interview with a cannibal. Oh, man, that's right. too damn funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, I'm going to jump off a fucking cliff with a parachute. Did anybody else? Did anybody else have a, con or a a question about the topics at hand? Doug, look, man, I I really believe you need some help, dude. I mean, the stuff you're talking about, it, it's not. Y'all not going back and forth talking about one thing. You just okay. That's not merited. Open eye. I you might not make something. Why did you him? No, you're fine. Uh, because I, he he does this a lot. He just derails. I'm leaving. Have fun, y'all. Okay. I got work to do. Um, hey, who wants to leave? Uh, I need to talk about some real shit. <laughs> just... Doug, I have a question. I have an answer for you, Edward. Can I get the um, sources on those popes doing big Masonic handshakes? Um, if you, like, honestly, if you just look up, like, pope handshakes, you'll probably get, um, y you'll get it. I don't have sources right now, but... I mean, I can hang on. Okay. I'll, I'll give you one right now. 
let's see. Here's Pope Francis doing one. And actually, I'll give you two. This is him with Pope Benedict when he wasn't the Pope. Somebody has shaken my hand like that before. What's the technique? Um, let me go ahead and pull up. Uh, the most noticeable thing was the thumb and like the finger wrap around. Yeah, the wrap around and the rub on the wrist is what they do in Mason, bro. Like, that's like the higher degree ones. I'm talking about the one that was in the picture. Well, but you'd think the Pope would be the highest degree, right? So I don't know why, but they seem they seem to do um, lower grips for whatever reason. What's up? So the wisdom of the church comes from, you know, many scholastics over time, you know, spending time in order to construct a consensus and figuring out what the proper interpretation of scripture is. Um, there are some Catholics who are hermits, and there are some monastic orders that focus on uh, enthusiastic, you know, cloistered conduct. Um, I did an AMA on here a while back that uh, talked about being a fourth degree knight of Columbus. And, you know, we, we have to remember, even as Catholics, even when we're disciplined Catholics, that there is something called contemplative prayer. And that we, you know, in dire times like what's going on now with coronavirus, you know, when we can't necessarily go to church because we can't organize, that we uh, still have to maintain our faith by, you know, focusing on the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit and on the readings that we do on a regular basis, you know, whether it's an abbreviary or what have you. Um, it's just we have to remember that we are an organized church, right? So I'll talk with all parishioners all the time. And there are organizations like, I, I actually belong to another organization that I haven't mentioned before called Curcio, and it focuses on what we call a charismatic faith. So there are social aspects that are vital towards making sure that you maintain your faith properly. You don't want to get caught up and lost in your own head and, you know, just, <laughs> you, you, go, uh, you go in a crazy way. So. Yeah, shut the fuck up, you pussy, you fucking nigger. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Anyway, isn't he nice? I, I don't know. Like anyway, um, did you have anything else you wanted to ask? Snarl. All right. So I I just had a follow up question for you. Um, yeah, go for it. I mean, do you feel like you have a father son relationship with your God or with God? Like does I don't know how your relationship is with your own father, but I hope it's a good relationship. And but it, given, <laughs> is it or is it not? Uh, my dad and I do not get along very well. <laughs> He's not particularly faithful. Um, my brother, I'm actually, I guess you would argue, I'm, I belong to a family of uh, fourth ge generation of atheists. So my great grandfather was an atheist. My grandfather was an atheist. My father was basically an atheist. He just went through the motions. And my brother is an atheist. So, so, yeah. so did you just get MK ultra into spirituality or what? No, How'd you find no. out? Um, I was raised in the church and I didn't really like it when I was first being raised in the church. But uh, as I got older, basically I went through a number of steps and I, I came to realize that the way I was raised in the church was not the proper way to be raised. Nobody can. So... As a consequence, I ended up basically forgiving the church, realized the truth, and uh, I don't know. Sometimes I call myself like a counter-reformed Catholic. <laughs> you know, sometimes you end up figuring out the path the second go around, and uh, that's the way it worked out for me. So, are you 
what do you think uh, how valid are the claims made or in your eyes made against Vatican II as far as uh we'll, oh, we'll wrap it up in one word sexual immorality well you remember again I was talking about the different forms of love right you know agape eros pragma storage etc um, I think uh, Benedict got it right when he said that a lot of the issues there deal with the de-Hellenization of the faith. You know, when people lose their appreciation of sense of calmness, their understanding of love becomes very twisted. And they end up compensating. You know, one form of love ends up getting used to make up for the absence of another form of love, right? So... I think it's a deeper philosophical issue, and unfortunately, because people don't want to dive into deeper philosophy, you know, we now suffer the consequences of that. So, I, I don't know. I don't think that answered the question. Uh, just uh, on the yes or no, do you think the claims are valid? Uh, around around Second Vatican and how that relates, or just in general? Yeah, just we'll 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 just tie it up with Second Vatican because I mean, you've already caught. Well, not, I'm sorry, that's a bad term. You've already, like, we've already talked about the earlier corruption and, like, the age of harlots and et cetera, right. et cetera. So, I mean, the reason, like, you, it's, it's clear as history. So, I'm, I'm talking more about Vatican II today as far as their immorality oh, problems, goes. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I gotcha. I think the problem a lot of people have is they simply read uh, the Second Vatican, but then they don't read Humanus Vitae. So, they end up with a <laughs> partial understanding of what's really going on. Um, Second Vatican, I think, deals more with the way that mass is conducted and just conduct, you know, just connecting with the laity. I wouldn't really blame Second Vatican for the corruption and the conduct scandals. Okay. Um, so, I'll, I'll have I'll have a better source for this next time. Not next time. I'll actually I'll DM it to you as soon as I get it. But I, I heard a rather interesting claim that Catholics are far more Gnostic than uh, what people claim Gnostics are. I've actually heard from two different sources. Uh, the first being Bill Schnoblin, who you, you might want to, I don't know if you've heard of him, but you might want to take with a grain of salt how when he was in Catholic seminary, he was required to write a paper about how the crucifixion and resurrection didn't happen. Oh, yikes. And... Uh, he when he he made great use of the scriptures to show that it did happen, and he either got a D or an F or something. Um, so that that's a pretty that's a pretty bold claim right. um, to to make a second witness to it. A pastor from a church I'm affiliated with, uh, not not like my home church, but I I know the man. He's a man of God. He um he he talked about how he was doing a Skype with some Catholic. Priest, I believe, it's either our parishes or some some somewhere along the the Catholic higher spiritual hierarchy, um, where they they had talked about in the Skype conversation about how the resurrection didn't happen, and he had to show them in the scriptures that it did. So it was. I have two different witnesses. Um, the first one is a little iffy because the man talked about being a ninety degree Freemason, but the other man he. I mean, he has a fruitful life as a Christian, and he—I mean, he's a man that speaks by the Spirit. So it's—and I don't know if you're seeing this in Catholicism, but um, how how worrisome would that be for you if the Catholic Church just flipped a 180 and started talking about how the crucifixion and resurrection didn't happen? Um. Okay. So. Regardless of the sources that you've presented, I mean, I've, I have felt that way among many laity in the church, where they focus on knowledge, 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 and they don't focus on faith enough. Um, my understanding when looking at laity clergy social dynamics is that clergy tend to conform to the laity rather than the other way around because the shepherds want to maintain their flock. And that is a major issue. Um, <clears throat> shepherds are supposed to be disciplined. And they're supposed to expect the flock to do what it's supposed to do. But because it's become increasingly whimsical, it's allowed these knowledge-based paradigms to uh, fester more and more. Um, why have these knowledge-based paradigms fester? I think a lot of this is because... Okay, so I'm going back to the Americanism heresy. 
if you look at American history back then during the 1870s to 1890s, there was an ideology called pragmatism that was taking off. And pragmatism actually has roots in Calvinist theology. Um, it comes from a, a movement called post-millennialism. And if you want, you can read about the uh, secular extraction of its essence by William James, Charles Sanders, Pierce, and John Dewey. Um, but basically, in America, because we focus on freedom of religion so much, and because there's this tolerance of alternate denominations, the appreciation of the mystery of good works was scorned. So, you know, you had all these Catholics from Ireland, Italy, and Poland who were assimilating into America. And, you know, the Catholic Church goes, oh, no, you guys are committing a heresy. The Protestants in America, you know, they, they had a, fl uh, a backlash. And the Catholics themselves, you know, they didn't really know how to handle it. And then on the European side of things, you know, you have the Protestants who are criticizing the Americanist accusations. And then even the Catholics, you know, they're going through however many political, you know, uh, forms of turmoil, whether it's, you know, the Franco-Prussian War, the unification of Italy, or the uh, Austro-Prussian War. The bottom line here is when you start to deny the mystery of good works, as was imposed by the onset of pragmatism, it makes it really difficult to maintain a purely faithful appreciation of what you're doing. So people become more knowledge-based and the consequences the church tries to adapt. So does that answer your question? Um, not particularly, but I, I'll, I'll accept it as an answer. Um, if moving on. Ask, well, if, if you think I left something in doubt, you can, uh, you can ask me to clarify. Um, no, I just think he kind of, like, when I ask questions about this, like, it's, I think he feel, I, I feel like he dodged a point, but just to build on this, just to build on this issue, like, you kind of, you, you kind of, like, shoot down this idea of knowledge, like, it, it seems like you're vehemently ta attacking the idea of just knowledge in general, but I, I guess I, what I'd have to ask is, like, wouldn't, wouldn't your faith have to be based on knowledge of the scriptures, like not so much as interpretation, but just like, hey, this is what the Bible says. Um, and not, not so much as focusing on what it means. Like the Bible says, preach the gospel to every creature, right? So without like getting into interpretation, just acknowledging what it says, like, oh, hey, Jesus raised people from the dead. It's like, oh, hey, Jesus was used from the dead. Like wouldn't knowledge of the scripture be the dictator of what we're supposed to have faith in in the first place? I think this is kind of pushing the boundaries on uh, revealed truth. So when we talk about knowledge, we're really talking about an epistemological construct here. Um, I, I mean, I would obviously concur with you that you need to be familiar with scripture. You need to be familiar with what is said in the Bible. That, that's obviously undeniable, right? But the question is, are you focusing on specific details here, there, and the other place in order to give you specific concrete expectations of how the world works? Or are you coming to an informal spirit of appreciation for how the entire narrative of scripture comes together? If you get the informal narrative, then you'll understand how faith comes first. If you're expecting specific, you know, insights then you're putting knowledge first i mean it is so the scriptures state that the spirit of truth will lead you in all truth uh that you shall have no need of a man to teach you for his anointing shall teach you um that the spirit that you hear from the spirit what the father speaks from heaven i mean we have examples like well, just the first example and i think it's acts eight i might have the address wrong but when when Philip talks to the Ethiopian, it, it says that the Spirit said unto Philip, go and join him, right? So that's like one of the first instances we have of the Holy Spirit speaking to someone. Now, we don't really have much or any kind of insight into Philip's life. but And what we do have is just an example of like literally the Holy Spirit speaking to him. And I'm, I'm over here thinking like, where... Well, I mean, I'm not over here thinking because I have the examples because I, I have this in my own life where the Spirit said unto me and I I went and did. I'm just wondering where that is in Catholic Ox and Protestant theology um, mm -hmm. where, where people where people have like, and it's, it's not so much just about faith. It's like 
where, where's the father father son relationship with God? Because like the whole idea is that the uh, those who believe on Jesus are made uh, are made like sons of God, mm-hmm. and like as far as I'm aware, you know, and I, I, unless you want to try to like you have something that proves you're wrong on this scripturally that Christianity is supposed to be like a father son relationship with God. And like with any kind of father son relationship, um, if, if the father tells his son to go do something, Hey, uh, go help, go get this tool for me. Hey, shine a flashlight here. Hey, uh, clean your room, do the laundry. Um, or just like, and just stuff where like a father sits down and he teaches his son as like, Hey, this is how you do this. Mm-hmm. This is how you do that. I mean, it seems like, if, from what I understand, it seems like the Bible is this thing, and like where it provides um, clarity as to who your father is, what your father wants you to do. It gives you the tool set to how to do it, and everything else just seems to like get in the way. Okay, so you're familiar with the woes of the Pharisees? Um, yeah, but. Okay. Please give context as to what you're talking about. Well, my concern here is how, you know, Jesus does tell us not to be Pharisees in uh, playing word games or focusing on specific details. And, you know, there's however many instances where the Pharisees try to trap Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you that it's like you're trying to trap me here because I don't think you are. I think you're very genuine in your appreciation. What I am saying, though, is... The issue with the Pharisees is that they were focusing on the literal, uh, what's it called, works of law, in contrast to appreciating grace before law. So yeah, I mean, we are given however many directives within scripture as to how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, right? But this doesn't mean that we're supposed to, you know, do this, like, this exact thing right here, right there, because the fact of the matter is we have to be flexible in how we appreciate our gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? So if you simply do the exact thing as it's said right here, right there, I mean, short of you simply living an ancient primitive way of life, you know, for however many thousands of years, you're going to get stuck, right? I mean, does that make sense to you? I mean, it does, but I I mean, God literally told me to, Preached the gospel to birds, so I I went and I told birds to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, <laughs> like, it, no, bro, like, I'll give you an example. So, I I I bought a homeless woman food who came into my church looking for a food bank. We didn't have a food bank, so I bought her a meal next door, okay. and the spirit said unto me, "Buy her another meal," and I have no idea why. I thought she like I thought God was telling me she's really hungry and she's gonna scarf down two fried rice. <laughs> so I bought her a second meal and I told her that she could come eat in the church, and she told me that she had to go find her friend who was more hungry than she was. So the spirit told me to feed this man or woman or I don't know who it was who I had no idea who existed. So it was it was I mean there's nothing short of that. There's nothing uh, short of divine intervention there, where I, or something like, you, you know what I mean? Um, I kind of get what you mean, but did you say that you were, you were preaching to birds? <sighs> I, so the scripture, the scripture popped up in my heart, uh, preach the gospel law, every creature, All right? And so I was I was literally right next to two turtle doves sitting next to the grass. So I'm like, hey, they're creatures. And I looked at them and I told them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they, they like looked at me, they flew up on the wall, they looked at me again and they flew away. And I thought like, I'm either going crazy or I'm about to go start telling rocks. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, because, you know, in the Bible, in the Bible, it says the rocks sing, pra- or rocks sing praises unto God. Now, I don't interpret that to mean anything short of what it says, that rocks sing praises on the God. In fact, Jesus talks about this when the Pharisees tell Jesus to tell his followers to shut up. He goes, if they don't cry out, the rocks will. And I'm kind of waiting for that day where I don't hear anybody praising Jesus. And all of a sudden I hear a bunch of rocks go, hallelujah. <laughs> all right. Now, look, I, I'm not an expert on scripture. I'm familiar with it. So, 
you're gonna, I mean, when, when you get the moment, uh, just send me a PM and let me look at what exactly you're looking at so I can look at the wider context and get some commentary. But, um, yeah, I want to make sure you're interpreting this correctly. I, I don't want to give you a half-baked answer if I uh, can't uh, give you a full-baked one. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one of my prayers. Yeah, go uh, for it. I, and I'll, I'll pull up these scriptures for, for you right now. Um, it is, I, I pray, I pray to God that he would deliver me from my interpretation and the interpretation of others. And I pray that his anointing and the spirit of truth would lead me into truth in all things. Right. So, and like, and when I, when I do that, it's like, the results are amazing. Like one of the things God showed me in the book of Ruth was how Israel and, um, Israel and the Gentile church are represented in Naomi and Ruth. Okay. So it's, and just like when, and especially when I do that, like, um, I'll read verses that like, that are, I guess are about myself. Cause I had a pastor tell me that the Bible doesn't mean anything until you find yourself in it. And so when I ask God to show me where I am in the Bible, um, I won't necessarily reveal where right now, but it, I, the only thing I can say is one, it was me, and two, uh, I I wept like quite a bit. So, yeah. Seems like it's well narrated. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. definitely connect and relate with it. Um, but yeah, give me, give me the verses. Let me read into the context and let me give you a better answer. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, just send me a PM and we can talk about that on a deeper level. Um, it seems like everybody's leaving podcast, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Thank you for jo joining us on oh, on boy. the Roundtable podcast. Uh, it's been Sir Dogleton and MJPC bringing you this de this debate. Find us on our social media. Find us on the Discord under Politics and Conspiracy. We're also on several podcast forums. Uh, thank you, and have a good night. Uh, Merlin, if you would shut down the bot. Uh, Merlin, are you still there? I think he's there. But, uh, yeah, Doug, I just want to say I'm always impressed by how knowledgeable you are on uh, what you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you definitely have a, a wide understanding of any number of uh, pieces of scripture. So, to hit an issue uh, with the Gospel of Judas with you, just on a couple of notes. Um, hang on, let me make sure this, hang on.